Uh, yeah. Uh, family, y'all. Just keep it tight, keep it tight, keep it tight. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Here we go, here we go. Uh. Athanasius of Alexandria. We can think within our families and among our friends, there are different people who have nicknames, right? Hey, como estas pollo? Nickname is that different people have in our families, right? Well, Athanasius had a nickname too. What was his nickname? Black Dwarf. <laughs> Black Dwarf gives us a sense in Spanish. Sometimes we use the, the nickname Negrito or Negro. Como estas Negro? What does that mean? It simply means that the person Nickel. is a little, a little darker. <laughs> And if they were calling him dwarf, what can we imagine about his stature? He probably was not the tallest person in the room, right? So Athanasius, blank dwarf being the nickname, was at the Council of Nicaea, and he was later going to become the champion of orthodoxy. Thank goodness for people like Athanasius, who could defend us against these Arians and against Julian Apostate and all these other people who are not part of what it is that we believe. Athanasius is going to be, become the champion of orthodoxy. He was born in Coptic-speaking northern Egypt. So in northern Egypt, where the Nile River empties out, he's from roughly that region where they speak Coptic. It's interesting for us because the Coptic church survives to this day. Even in the Roman Catholic, we have a Coptic rite. It's one of the ancient churches. So he's from that part of northern Egypt. He was in close contact with the desert monks. Let's just re remember what happened in the last class. We talked about how it was that when Christianity became legal, became the, the, the church of the empire, many of the bishops and priests now started resembling the people within the hierarchy of the empire, being more wealthy. What was the counter-reaction? A lot of people decided to give all that up and go out in the desert. So he's in the middle of that action in the desert in northern Egypt. He wrote a work called On the Incarnation of the Word, that was his first work, speaking of the incarnation of God in Jesus. What does the word incarnation mean? Incarnation, we can see the root of that is carne. Carne means what in Spanish? Carne in Spanish means, it actually doesn't mean meat, it literally means flesh. In la carne. So when we eat meat, literally we're eating flesh in Spanish. Jesus came in flesh. His event of becoming in, when coming into the flesh was his incarnation. When God became flesh, that's the incarnation. When the Word becomes flesh. So here we will work on that, speaking of the incarnation of God in Jesus as the heart of Christianity. What is Christianity all about? It's about how it is that God became flesh in the person of Jesus. The Word made flesh. After the death of Bishop Alexandria of Alexandria in 328, after the Council of Nicaea, <clears throat> Athanasius was named the bishop in Alexandria. Why is that important? Because remember that in Egypt was the Nile River, at the mouth of the Nile River, where it flows in the Mediterranean Sea, is Alexandria. It was the center of learning at that day. So there were four patriarchs in the ancient church. Where were those patriarchs located? One was Alexandria. The next one up... The, up the line was in Jerusalem, and then in Antioch, and then over in Rome. Those are the four patriarchs of the church, in Alexandria, Jerusalem, Antioch, and Rome. So he is now one of the four patriarchs of the church. When people in the area are looking for what it is that we should believe, what it is we should be teaching, who are they looking to? They're looking to the patriarch. So in this case, he's now the patriarch, the bishop of Alexandria, and... We all have people who like us a little less. The people who liked him a little less and who were envious that he was made the Bishop of Alexandria, the way that they got at him was that they brought against him various charges, right? Saying that he did this and he did that and he believed this and he believed that. Okay? It's quite effective. Someone gets into a position of power, right? Obama is elected President of the United States. What happens then? Anyone who doesn't like Obama decides to come out with whatever it is they don't like about him. He wasn't born in the United States, or he's a Muslim, or whatever, you know. Same thing was happening back in the day of Athanasius. Athanasius now gets into this power, this position of influence, of power in Alexandria, which simply means that those who don't like him are going to come out. Constantine ordered him to defend himself in a synod at Tyre. Let's pause with that word synod. Have we seen that word before? A synod 
is a meeting of bishops. Have we heard of any synods going on recently? Mm -hmm. oh, interesting. In the Roman Catholic Church, what was, what's been happening these last few weeks? A synod in Rome. A synod then is when a group of bishops gets together to talk about certain matters. So, Constantine then is ordering that he, that he defend himself in front of a synod of bishops. It's not a council. A council is when all the bishops come together. At Nicaea, it was a council. We're getting together all the bishops. We're not getting together all the bishops to talk about the Patriarch of Alexandria, but we're getting together a synod, a group of bishops, to see whether these charges, that whether there's anything to these charges. Who gets to pick the bishops to get to go to the synod? Who gets to pick the bishops that go to the synod? Today or back then? Back then. Okay. So let's start with today. Good question. So today then, it depends on who would be part of that synod. So for instance, maybe it would be a synod of the, of the North American bishops. Or a synod of the, of the bishops of the United States. Oh, okay. Then all the bishops of the United States are invited to that synod. Back then, then what would happen then is a synod simply means a meeting of bishops. So whoever it is that would have been invited to that synod, you know, whether it was by region or however they determined that, is essentially the emperor saying, Ooh, there are these charges against you. You all work it out as bishops. You all meet as bishops. And if you can defend yourself in front of them, then, then I'm cool. So there's the sin of bishops, then they defend himself. For instance, they, they accused him of killing a rival bishop and of cutting off his hand for magical reasons. Now the challenge is that this is, a, this is a book of history and one of the critiques that I have of this book is that sometimes he deviates a bit from history and starts introducing stories and legends that are told as if they're history, right? It's sort of like the Bible in some places tells things as if they were history. Same here, what happens is that there are different stories. And so for instance, the story that Justo Gonzalez shares, if, if you've read far enough in the book, was about how it was that he brought in this person draped in a black cloth, because now he's accused of killing this person and cutting off his hand. So what's the way to prove that he didn't do it? He brings this bishop in, covered in a black cloth, and then takes off the cloth and says, look, he's alive. Did I kill him? Now think for, for a moment. If it's a rival bishop, are you going to agree, okay, yeah, I'll dress up in a black cloak and come in? I mean, it's, it just... There's just something about that story that strikes me more as legend than as history. But the, but the story that's told is that he was accused of killing a, a rival bishop and of cutting off his hand. And so the story that Trusco Gonzalez tells is of how it was that he brought in a person wrapped in a cloak and then took off the cloak and, whoa, it's him. So he didn't kill him. But they took off the cloak, but you couldn't see his hands yet. So, but he's still accused of cutting off a hand. So show us your left hand. Oh, so I didn't cut off his hand. Oh, but what about the other hand? I mean, it's almost like he's making a show out of this. Well, what about the other hand? Ooh, maybe cut off the other hand. No, you can see the other hand. Oh, does he have a third hand? I mean, the way that Husa Basala sort of frames it is, you know, it's sort of like this ridiculous story, which would have been comical or not, depending on how you felt about the issue. But what, what's interesting, I think, for our perspective as historians is, one, that he was accused of killing a rival bishop, Interesting to, to know whatever came of that accusation. And of cutting off his hand for magical reasons, simply meaning that someone accused him of cutting off someone's hand as a part of sorcery or witchcraft or whatever it is that they were accusing him of practicing. Oh, poor Athanasius. His life was filled with struggles and exiles. What we're going to see is that he's exiled, he runs out of Alexandria because of various persecutions, and then he comes back. And then something happens again and he runs away. And then he comes back. I mean, it's going to be this constant cycle of running away. Upon returning to Alexandria one time, Arian party members claimed he was not the legitimate bishop of the city, and they supported a rival claimant. So what happens if you're the bishop of Alexandria, but suddenly there's another party in town, it's almost like political parties today, right? Who's insisting that, wait a minute, you're not the bishop of Alexandria, but it's our person, Gregory, who's the bishop of Alexandria. Suddenly now we have two supposed bishops of Alexandria. What makes it worse is that Gregory, the other person, so now there's Athanasius, who really was the bishop of Alexandria, and now there's Gregory, who's supported by the Arians. Who is the government supporting, Athanasius or Gregory? The government supporting Gregory. And now Gregory is taking over all of your churches, 
So what do you start doing? When the emperor and the soldiers are on the side of the opposite party, and they start taking over your churches, what do you do? Do you stand up and fight? Athanasius then fled to Rome. How interesting. Back at that time, remember that the, the patriarchs were located in Alexandria, Jerusalem, Antioch, and Rome. He fled to Rome, got an audience with the bishop there, and they got the support of Bishop Julian and of Roman clergy. They, they pulled together a synod, a Roman synod. So anyone who was in the vicinity of Rome, all the bishops came to a synod. And they declared Athanasius the legitimate bishop of Alexandria. Case closed, right? No. Gregory is still back in Alexandria playing bishop, being bishop, and because his party chose him as bishop of Alexandria. So now we have this other bishop of Alexandria. What happens is that the bishop Gregory in Alexandria mismanaged the church to such an extent that when Athanasius came back claiming to be the bishop again, they were happy to see him. Constantius, who now ruled the empire after Constantine, did he favor the Orthodox Christians or did he favor the Arians? He favored the Arians. You follow what's happening now? So what's happening is we had, first we had Constantine favoring the Christians. We had Julian the Apostate. We have Constan Constantius, who's favoring the Arians. It's just this pendulum that keeps swinging back and forth now. So now we have an emperor who's favoring the Arians and who's forcing all bishops to accept it. Why would you force bishops to accept this teaching? Is it the same thing that Constantine was trying to do? To unite all of the bishops, you need them all singing the same song. So if you all would sing the Arian song, por favor, Right? I know that before we were singing the Mickey Mouse Club song, I'm going to tell you what, it's time for us all to sing the Donald Duck song now. Right? It's no longer the Orthodox Christian church. We're, we're Arian. We're Arian. It's time for you to sing the Donald Duck song. If you don't want to sing the Donald Duck song, then out with you. You can't be part of the Donald Duck song if you're singing the Mickey Mouse. You can't be part of the Donald Duck Club if you're singing the Mickey Mouse song. Right? So how interesting that the emperor was favoring Arianism, forcing bishops to accept Arianism. So what does Athanasius do? He's out again. Because the forces of Arianism are strong. He flees to live with the monks in the desert. Various synods were forced to declare themselves in favor of Arianism, according to Dr. Gonzalez. I mean, imagine that for a moment. Groups of bishops coming together saying, what do we believe? Uh, the emperor says that we believe in Arianism. What do we believe? I think we believe in Arianism too, right? So various groups of bishops, various synods, were convening and deciding that they believed in Arianism too. They were willing to support Arianism. How interesting then, that what began as this fight where Christianity originally won, Arian ran to the emperor, was not excited, so sort of Arianism continues to maintain his grasp on the, on the minds and imaginations of people. The high point of Arianism was the Council of Sirmium. In Sirmium, what did we do? We reversed the decision of Nicaea. Nicaea said that Jesus was God from God, light from light, true God from the true God, begotten, not made. Oh, no, 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 no. That was such a big mistake that we made at that council. So Arianism had now reached the point where they overturned this previous council, so as to say that Jesus was, was not, not made, Jesus was made. Jesus was created by the Father. When Constantius died and Juli Julian, the apostate, was named emperor, Athanasius returned to Alexandria. What are some of the points of Athanasius' uh, theology? Jesus, follow, the, follow his reasoning. Now, if Jesus is the Savior who restored the fallen, who were the fallen? Who, who, who were the first people to fall? First people to fall were Adam and Eve. What did they do? They sinned. Okay? So God created humans and we were good. But then what did we do? We sinned. So now if someone is going to restore us for having sinned, who can restore us becomes the question. Athanasius is saying that Jesus is the one who restored us from sin, who saved us from sin. Because of sin, a new creation was required. God created us, we sinned. So there has to be a new creation. And the one responsible for our recreation can be no less than the one who created us. 
Hello, did you hear me? I said a new creation. God created the world. There's going to be a new creation. Can anyone who's not God recreate the world? Becky, since we're using her as the example tonight, can Becky recreate the world for us? No, it takes God to create, recreate the world. And so if Jesus did that, what does that mean about Jesus? Jesus is God. God created the world. It's not going to take a recreation because we, we fell into sin. Who recreated the world? No one less than God. God itself, which is Jesus. Many people had opposed the Nicene Creed, fearing that the Son being of the same substance would be misinterpreted as both of them being the same. How interesting. Let's, let's talk about this for a moment. So in the Nicene Creed, we talk about how it is that we say of one being with the Father. Of one being. Or the other word that we use is of one substance. The Greek word is ousias. So what happens is that, wait a minute, if we say of one being with the Father, what will happen if people start thinking that God the Father and God the Son are the same thing? We're saying they're of the, they share the same being. Are they the same thing? And so some of the people who couldn't accept this word of one being or consubstantial for the Roman Catholics in Central Texas throughout the world who now use that word. They, we invented another word. The Greek word was homoousios, which simply meant of the same being. Homo means same, right? Anytime we see that in the beginning of a word, it means same, right? Homoousios then. Ousios means substance. So Jesus is of the same substance as the Father. He is homo usias. So far so good? Not everyone could accept that though. What do you mean he's of the same substance as the Father? You mean Jesus is God? Jesus is God and the same way the God the Father is God? They're both God? What's the distinction then? If they're both of one being, what's the difference between the two? You're saying that they're one or are you saying that they're two? Of one being means that they're one. Follow me? You're saying that they're one, of one being. Homo usias means they're one. Women, their father and their son. That's two. You're telling me that they're one? The math doesn't add up. They're one. You're telling me they're one, but yet it's father and it's son. Father, son, one plus one is not equal to one. So far so good? So we invented another word, and that word was homo usias. We're simply meant that we added an I in the middle. And in Greek, that changed the meaning from not of one being, but instead now it was of a similar substance. Oh, well, that's okay. We can accept that. You follow me? So those who had a problem with the original creed saying of one being with the Father, if we just tweak that, if we use a different Greek word, that means of a similar being is the Father, then we can all get along. Can we all agree that Jesus is either of one being or of a similar being to the Father? So, we introduced a new word to be able to appease those who are having a problem with this new formulation. Athanasius tried to convince people that Nicaea could be interpreted to mean just that. Homo eusios. You could interpret Nicaea to mean this. Of a similar substance, of a, of a similar being with the Father. So long as you don't understand that there are three gods. As Christians, do we believe in three gods? No, we're monotheists. We believe in one God. We don't believe in three gods. So don't misinterpret this. You can say of a similar being, but don't let that make you believe that Jesus is not God. Jesus is God. We're monotheists. We only believe in one God. God the Father is God. Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is God. We soon say the Council of Constantinople in 381. Like the Arians, oh, we, we started learning from our enemies, right? They were out in the streets chanting. So what did we decide to do? We decided to create our own chants, right? Our own things that shout in the street. Our own hymns on who the Trinity is. Of the Trinity being of one being. Of Jesus being of one being with the Father of one substance with the Father. So our most ancient hymns on the Trinity 
go back to this time period, how it is that Jesus is of, of one being with the Father. Most of the church supported Nicaea, despite the, the Arians who didn't support it. And the, the teachings of Nicaea then were ratified at the church's second ecumenical council, which occurred in Constantinople in 381. What is Constantinople? Again, Constantinople was the capital of the, the capital of the empire in the east. So Constantinople, at the place where Asia meets Europe, at the place where Africa meets Asia, Constantinople would be the, the second council that we gathered together in 381. Nicaea was before that. Constantinople would be the second in 381 where we confirmed what we said in, at Nicaea. What we said at Nicaea, that's really what we believe. That God the Father is God. God the Son is God. God the Holy Spirit is God.